All right, welcome to uh, our event today. Um, I'm Amy Seawright, I'm the uh, Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program here at CSIS. And it's my honor to welcome you all to our event, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Strategy in Southeast Asia, a status report on the economic pillars. As you know, last July, um, in a speech at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced a, a program of new initiatives aimed at enhancing U.S. economic diplomacy in the region in three areas, energy, infrastructure, and the digital economy. And today, we thought we would take stock of the progress of two of these initiatives, those in energy and infrastructure, and also dive into how APEC can serve as a, as a vehicle for delivering on the economic pillars of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and for economic diplomacy in the region more generally. So to discuss APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, I'm delighted to welcome the new US senior official for APEC, Sandra Odekirk, to deliver her first public remarks in her new role. And we're very honored uh, to host her for these remarks today. Uh, and following Deputy Assistant Secretary Odekirk's remarks, we will turn to a panel that we've assembled of experts drawn from industry and from government uh, to update us on the status of the energy and infrastructure pillars of the Indo-Pacific strategy and assess their impact, especially with an eye towards Southeast Asia. So I'm very excited that we were able to put this event together with the support from Chevron. But let me begin this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome U.S. Senior Official for APEC, Sandra Odekirk. Sandra Odekirk has had a distinguished career in the Foreign Service since 1991, where she most recently served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Diplomacy in the Bureau of Energy Resources. Prior to that, she served as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Threat Finance and Sanctions in the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. After several tours abroad, in many places, including China, Jamaica, and Turkey. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Odekirk to the podium to deliver her remarks. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank the National Center for APEC and the Center for Strategic and International Studies for this opportunity to update you on the US vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific and to provide a status update on the energy and infrastructure initiatives of the Indo-Pacific strategy. The United States has a vision to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific. President Trump identified the Indo-Pacific as among the United States' most important priorities in his address to the APEC CEO Summit in Vietnam in 2017. And in November of last year, Vice President Pence reaffirmed the U.S. vision for the region at the leaders' meeting in, in Papua New Guinea as a constellation of nations that are sovereign, strong, and satellites to none. Since the President's announcement in 2017, we have mobilized the entire U.S. government to begin bringing this vision to fruition. The U.S. Indo-Pacific vision is built on principles that are widely shared throughout the region, ensuring the freedom of the seas and skies, insulating sovereign nations from external coercion, promoting market-based economics, open investment environments, and fair and reciprocal trade, and supporting good governance and respect for individual rights. The United States is committed to fulfilling the President's Indo-Pacific vision through expanding engagement with all countries of the region in three vital areas, economics, governance, and security. Today, I'm here to address the economic pillar of the Indo-Pacific vision and to provide you with some updates on how we're doing. Cooperation with partner countries and regional institutions such as ASEAN and APEC is key. Support for ASEAN centrality is a cornerstone of our Indo-Pacific strategy. As Secretary Pompeo said at the first Indo-Pacific Business Forum, ASEAN is literally at the center of the Indo-Pacific, and it plays a central role in the Indo-Pacific vision that America is promoting. APEC is the cornerstone of the economic pillar of the Indo-Pacific vi vision. Through APEC, we level the playing field for U.S. businesses by facilitating transparent and efficient cross-border trade processes, strengthening policies to improve the business environment and create economic opportunity, and advancing free and fair trade and investment practices. Our strategy is inclusive. As Secretary Pompeo has said multiple times, our Indo-Pacific vision excludes no nation. 
We seek to work with anyone to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific so long as that cooperation adheres to the highest standards that our citizens demand. This Indo-Pacific vision is not a concept unique to the United States, but is shared by many nations in the region. Through our respective initiatives may differ somewhat, our Indo-Pacific strategy and those of our allies and partners are complementary and are guided by a commitment to uphold the rules-based order in the region. Developing countries in the Indo-Pacific need $1.7 trillion in infrastructure investment every year. No single government has this much money. That's why our strategy seeks to create the conditions needed to unlock private sector investment. According to the financial firm BlackRock, more than $70 trillion is stockpiled in the world's financial centers looking for investable opportunities. We believe that our Indo-Pacific economic vision can help bridge the gap between infrastructure investment needs and available capital. Our private sector is one of the United States' biggest strengths, and no one invests more in the Indo-Pacific than U.S. businesses. U.S. FDI more than doubled from 2007 to 2017, reaching $940 billion. In 2016, U.S. direct investment supported 5.1 million jobs in the Indo-Pacific region. We are not alone in our focus on the private sector. The more a country embraces the private sector, the more that country grows. And the reverse is true as well. State-dominated and directed investment results in corruption, unevenly distributed economic growth, and ultimately, public backlash. Based on consultations with allies and partners, we identified the digital economy, infrastructure, and energy as target sectors for, develop for development. Today, I'm going to focus on our energy and infrastructure strategies. One of the economic elements of our Indo-Pacific economic vision is Asia Edge, which stands for Enhancing Development and Growth Through Energy. Asia Edge is a whole of government effort to grow sustainable and secure energy markets throughout the Indo-Pacific. Asia Edge seeks to strengthen the energy security of our allies and partners, create open, efficient, rules-based, and transparent energy markets, improve free, fair, and reciprocal energy trading relationships, and expand access to affordable, reliable energy throughout the Indo-Pacific region. In practical terms, Asia Edge provides technical assistance to improve partner countries' regulatory environments and energy-related procurement processes, works with partners to develop national and regional energy market plans, uses development finance to encourage the, develop the deployment of private capital, and helps countries to develop smart grids and other forms of modern energy infrastructure. Another element of the Indo-Pacific Vision's economic pillar is ITAN, which stands for the Infrastructure Transaction and Assistance Network. Like EDGE, ITAN is also a whole of government initiative to develop high quality and financially sustainable infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region. The, initi the initiative established a new interagency body, coordinated by the National Economic Council, to optimize U.S. tools for assessing projects, directing development finance, and deploying technical assistance to strengthen infrastructure planning and procurement in partner countries. ITAN also established a new transaction advisory fund to help partner countries access private legal and procurement support for infrastructure negotiations and development. And so it's my great pleasure today to share with you some early successes associated with Asia Edge and ITAN. First for Asia Edge, which CSIS is going to help all of you learn a lot more about next month when uh, ENR Assistant Secretary Fannin speaks to a, a similar grouping, but I'm going to give some highlights. Um, so in November of 2018, Vice President Pence at the APEC leaders meeting, along with the Prime Ministers of Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea, signed a joint statement and announced the Papua New Guinea Electrification Partnership, which is designed to meet the electricity infrastructure development needs of the people of Papua New Guinea while avoiding unsustainable debt burdens. Since then, we have undertaken a collaborative scoping mission that has identified specific projects which are increasing Papua New Guinea's access to electricity. In Indonesia, the U.S. Agency for International Development is partnered with the State Electricity Electric Company to, to um, assist in its efforts to modernize their power grids and diversify the country's energy sources. In Vietnam, state and USAID are working with the government of Vietnam to implement its power development plan and attract private sector investment. 
In both the Philippines and Vietnam, the State Department is providing legal assistance in employing international best practices in legal and regulatory regimes for importing liquefied natural gas, a growing export market for the United States. In ASEAN, we are partnered with the ASEAN Council on Petroleum, or ASCOPE, to exchange information on natural gas infrastructure and markets, laying the groundwork for U.S. exports of LNG to the region. Additionally, Japan has aligned $10 billion in financing with Asia Edge to, sim to stimulate investment in U.S.-Japan private sector projects, and we have also coordinated uh, with Japan's energy capac capacity building efforts uh, in activities such as LNG value chain and procurement training in Southeast Asia. So you can see we've done a lot, and I'm sure Assistant Secretary Fannin will have more to say next month. When we look at ITAN, on the infrastructure side of things, we see that in South Asia, the United States has expanded a regional technical assistance program that is developing transparent legal and procedural frameworks to oversee complex infrastructure contracts. We're preparing to launch the Transaction Advisory Fund, or TAF, by the third quarter of this year. The TAF will provide transaction-specific advisory services to countries to build capacity to assess potential infrastructure projects, including through legal services and technical assistance for contract negotiations. And since the July 2018 U.S. Indo-Pacific Business Forum, the Department of Commerce, USAID, and other agencies leading implementation of the Indo-Pacific strategy have conducted multiple rounds of consultation with U.S. industry, pinpointing areas of interest for the U.S. private sector investment in the Indo-Pacific Indo region. In the Philippines, the United States has increased technical assistance to support the Philippines' ambitious infrastructure development strategy known as Build, Build, Build. And in the Maldives, the United States has identified areas for cooperation to improve public financial management, including in, through public procurement practices. To enhance the U.S. government's ability to promote private sector-led development globally, including in the Indo-Pacific, President Trump, in October of last, of last year, signed into law the Better Utilization of Investments Leading to Development Act, better known as the BUILD Act. The new law consolidates, modernizes, and reforms the U.S. government's development finance capabilities, primarily, uh, OPIC and U primarily OPIC and USAID's Development Credit Authority into the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC. This expansion of the U.S. toolkit to mobilize private sector investment will fuel more growth opportunities in the Indo-Pacific. The new DFC, which is set to launch on October 1 of this year, and you'll have a panelist talking about this uh, in a few moments, will have a six, $60 billion investment portfolio capacity, which will more than double the current cap. It will also have the authority to make equity investments, enabling increased cooperation with our allies and partners to advance shared goals. The DFC will also have the ability to provide technical assistance and to conduct feasibility studies to better enable U.S. engagement at earlier stages of the project lifecycle. So in closing, the U.S. economic vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific requires a long time horizon. Similarly, the energy and infrastructure initiatives we are undertaking are meant to be long-term, uh, a, 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 a statement of the U.S.'s enduring and long-term commitment to the region. Through Asia Edge and ITAN, we are laying the groundwork for years and years of private sector investment in the Indo-Pacific. This involvement will support U.S. exports and jobs, strengthen our alliances and partnerships with numerous countries across the region, and create a constellation of strong and independent nat nations at the center of the U.S. vision for the Indo-Pacific. So I'd like, Amy, once again, to thank you for this opportunity to address the CSIS, and I'd, I'd like to give special thanks to the National Center for APREC for helping to organize the, the event and to Chevron for sponsoring it. I look forward to your questions and, the, and to the panel discussion to follow. Thank you. Um, these initiatives have taken on a very, you know, they're about the Indo-Pacific, obviously part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, you've said in your remarks that Secretary Pompeo and others have made clear that uh, ASEAN centrality is a, is a pillar of the Indo-Pacific strategy, and of course Southeast Asia is central to the region. 
But I think um, when I've traveled to the region, I'm often asked about these initiatives and how, what, what the real role is going to be for Southeast Asia specifically. So I wonder if you could share with us uh, any sense, um, any, any uh, perspective you have in terms of when we look at the initiatives as they develop for infrastructure and for energy, is there going to be a real focus on Southeast Asia or will they be spread very broadly throughout the very large region of the Indo-Pacific? So, okay, great. Amy, thank you so much for that question. That's a really good one. I, our focus very much is um, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So um, Southeast Asia obviously collectively is a much, much larger market than uh, the Pacific Island states. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but so in a sense you can say that Southeast Asia is going to be sort of the driver of where we see this uh, future investment going. Mm -hmm. And I think that's driven by the role that Southeast Asia plays in sort of the evolving economies of the Indo-Pacific region. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is particularly in the area of energy, but also for infrastructure. It's where growth is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, demand, the economic growth is strong. Uh, demand for electricity, demand for high quality infrastructure, it's all growing in Southeast Asia. So I think we're definitely going to see um, a lot of focus from these uh, whole of government initiatives mm -hmm. on Southeast Asia the nations individually and collectively as a group. Mm -hmm. that, I think that would be very welcome uh, news to the, to the region. Um, turning to your role as APEC Senior Advisor, and I know you're brand new in this role, so, uh, so this might not be uh, quite fair, but I wanted to ask you, uh, as you take on this role, what, are, what do you think the United States priorities are going to be for APEC this year and, and you know, beyond? Uh, there is an energy working group within APEC that's led by Department of Energy, and we'll hear from Phyllis Yoshida on our panel, who used to be the lead Sherpa for that, about uh, the work that APEC does in energy. But many people have said over the years that uh, APEC uh, could play a larger role in the energy, uh, in the energy cooperation, that that, that, that uh, working group, that mm -hmm. aspect of APEC could be kind of revitalized. And of course, APEC does a lot of other things you know, there's a lot of um, discussion about rules of the road, uh, best practices, particular sectors, um, digital, the digital economy has come into focus. So how is APEC going to fit in to the, the broader picture of U.S. economic diplomacy and these initiatives in energy and infrastructure going forward? Great. So as I said, um, APEC really is the cornerstone of our e economic and great engagement with the Asia Pacific and, and mm -hmm. the Pacific facing uh, Latin American uh, economies that are part of APEC. Mm -hmm. um, and at its core, APEC's value add is as a trade and investment liberalization forum. Mm -hmm. It's also almost a, uh, a sandbox for innovation as mm -hmm. a non-binding consensus driven uh, organization. It's a place where we can surface ideas mm -hmm. um, and, and discuss them and work on capacity building and other types of initiatives without being bound by you know, long, long standing binding commitments. So mm -hmm. let's just try things out. Our priorities with regard to APEC, uh, certainly for this year, and these have been pretty enduring, have been a focus on the digital economy, mm -hmm. on services, mm -hmm. on uh, women's economic empowerment, in particular women in STEM, an area where the United States has, has made a lot of progress but still has, um, I think, a lot of uh, scope to, to learn and to, from our partners and to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, uh, in cooperation with the Chilean host economy, there's also a strong focus on uh, marine and ocean issues, including uh, mm -hmm. combating marine debris, dealing with illegal, unlicensed, and unreported fishing, uh, those types of issues, which where the nations of the Pacific really, ha or the economies of the Pacific, really have a, uh, a lot of room uh, to discuss this and to grow. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question about the Pacific Island region? The Pacific Islands, other than Papua New Guinea, are not members of APEC. Um, but in, there have been ways in the past that uh, leaders have been invited to APEC summits. Um, there have been ways to, you know, to try to tie them in more to the discussions that happen around APEC. Do you have any plans this year to try to 
uh, incorporate or connect the architecture that's focused on the Pacific Islands region with APEC? So to the best of my knowledge, APEC is not planning um, an event like that this year. I think Papua New Guinea was, a, had, was in a particularly good position mm -hmm. to do that uh, last year. Uh, New Zealand will be the host economy in uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. Once again, very much a Pacific, uh, a, a Pacific economy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we, we can look forward to continuing engagement um, among and between APEC and the Pacific Island states. Okay. Well, let me open it up uh, to questions from the audience. We have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions for Das Odenkirk. And if, uh, if you do have a question, please raise your hand and we will bring you a microphone and I'll ask you to briefly introduce yourself. I think you've done such a good job <laughs> explaining <laughs> The administration strategy that we have very uh, we have a very satisfied audience. We do have a question over here. This young woman, and again, if you wouldn't mind briefly introducing yourself before you ask a question. All right. Um, good morning. My name is Prawa Gulan. Um, I am an intern at the Royal Thai Embassy, specifically in the Office of Economy and Financial Affairs. So, um, thank you so much for your remarks. And I have a question on um, how do you prospect the potential resistance of this project, the Indo-Pacific strategy, towards the um, Southeast Asian nations? And how would you uh, mitigate that resistance? Yeah, thank you. So actually, I, I, don't think we have an, we, I don't think we've experienced a lot of resistance on the part of Southeast Asian nations. Um, my sense is that um, the Southeast Asia, the, the nations of Southeast Asia welcome the prospect of um, enhanced and increased uh, U.S. private sector investment, which I think is core to this strategy. Uh, the key, so the Indo-Pacific strategy, if you look at it, comes kind of in two um, facets. There's an inward focus, U.S. government interagency aspect to the Indo-Pacific strategy, which quite frankly has been a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, over the last 10 to 12 months, has been coordinating ourselves, ensuring that our mechanisms are uh, linked up, work together, that they complement rather than uh, compete with one another internally, so that we don't have duplication, we don't have gaps. The outward looking part of the strategy really is about um, messaging and promoting this vision of an Indo-Pacific that is governed by um, the sort of free and fair and reciprocal relationships among and between sovereign nations where countries and companies and, and individuals are able to compete on a level playing field um, and, and the, the most attractive corporate proposal succeeds through um, a transparent and open process. So when I spoke earlier, both on the energy side and on the uh, infrastructure side, talked a lot about procurement and governance and transparency and tender rules and legal advice, which sounds very boring um, <laughs> or very technical. Um, but getting that right enables the private sector to flourish. It enables market competition to take place with as complete of information or knowledge um, as possible. And so getting that core framework right is absolutely essential. We've definitely seen it here uh, in the United States. We think that this is a vision of a, a sort of a, a framework or a set of paradigms that, is, that could and should be universally attractive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A question here in the front row. And sir, please identify yourself before you ask a question. Hello, uh, Chris McRae, Norman McRae Foundation. So you mentioned, I think, the BlackRock figure of $75 trillion, and at a UN conference about a year ago, there was another figure of $300 trillion. So these are orders of magnitude different from, you know, $60 billion. So 
Uh, and if you're coming from the issue of 60% of the world living in, in Asia and the sort of sustainability development goals, so a lot of urgent things one could argue are going on. How, how does one match the two, the sort of where you're coming from and where you know, four billion Asians are coming from? So I think um, how we view the US um, sort of direct US government funding or investment is as a catalyst for private sector investment. So once again, going back to the issues with regard to transparency, with tender rules, with bidding requirements, with ensuring that the frameworks are set up in a way that allows for free, fair, reciprocal competition. That's, I think, the role that government has to play. Because quite frankly, uh, pri the private sector's ability to identify markets, to identify commercially viable projects, it, it is far better than having a government, any government, pick a winner. Um, and so I think the plan that we have and the strategy that we have with embedded in the Indo-Pacific strategy in each of the three uh, sectoral uh, focuses really is to set up the sort of regular, or to help countries set up the regulatory and legal enabling environment that allows for a flourishing private sector, that allows for capital to flow. Good. Okay, question over here. Hi, I'm Evan Carlick with the U.S. military background. I was hoping you could speak a little bit about the recent contention regarding petroleum exploration in the South China Sea yeah. and how that's linked to Southeast Asia's continued okay. energy security. Thanks. Okay, so that is really a question for Assistant Secretary Fannin. <laughs> so come to our event next month. Yes, yeah, so come to the <laughs> event next <laughs> month. But, but I think yeah. that, um, you know, the issue of resource nationalism um, all over the world, I'd say is particularly, uh, there's a particularly a focus in the South China Sea, is one where the United States has had a strong policy for decades that countries ought to be able to explore and to produce all of the resources in their exclusive economic zones, whether that's fisheries or hydrocarbons or you know some as so, something else, that that's a that's a, a firmly founded policy that we have, and it's applicable in the South China Sea just as it would be you know in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, question in the front row here. Thank you. Uh, now, India. Um, could you uh, under could, I'm sorry, could you introduce yourself first? My name is Vaman Desai. I'm a director at Bava Group Asia. Uh, India, in its new administration, has a renewed interest, uh, has a look east policy when it's trying to firm up its relationship with the South Southeast Asian countries. Now, given the larger strategic um, you know, convergence of United States and India in the Indo Pacific, how do you see uh, the India's look east policy? falling within the framework of what you just described, um, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States. Thank you. H how, how do they can sort of collaborate better in, in sort of, you know, uh, bringing those dividends together? So we work with India a lot, uh, bilaterally and through um, a variety of sort of, inter of international groupings. G20 is a great example of that. Um, and India clearly is a, a pillar of the Indo-Pacific. It's the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. And it's also a great example, I think, for a lot of countries moving over towards the Asia Pacific. It's the world's largest democracy. Um, and it's an example of how a country can, has, is on the energy and infrastructure side of things, really is grappling with growing energy demand. Uh, um, sort of engagement with international markets for uh, oil and gas, uh, and also a lot of advances in terms of renewable and um, efficiency technologies. So India is, uh, in many ways, um, an excellent partner for the United States as we work with um, the developing world, because India and the United States both are very, very large countries, large economies. We have a lot of subnational linkages, and um, India has been a laboratory 
for developing a lot of, in particular, I would say, I would say off-grid renewable technologies that are applicable to many countries in Southeast Asia. Very good. Okay, question over here in the middle row. Please identify yourself. Hi, thank you. I'm Christine Covington with the uh, International Energy Team at Deloitte. Uh, my question is about the potential trade conflict with China. There's been for several years now, uh, a conflict regarding solar panels that has the potential to be magnified by the uh, additional potential trade conflict with China. How do you see that impacting the strategies that you've laid forth here uh, for the remainder of the Asian Pacific nations? So like I said, the, our Indo-Pacific vision is an inclusive vision. It's a vision open to all, including China. Um, the, the real key is ensuring that the the that it's a high standards vision, that it incorporates as a core and foundational aspect of the discussion, uh, f fair trade, free trade, um, adherence to contract, reciprocity, and those are, those are topics and those are principles that we hope everyone can embrace, all trading partners. Cool. Let me ask you a question um, about you mentioned New Zealand is coming up in two years. Um, looking at next year, Malaysia will be hosting APEC. And um, you know, Malaysia's been a pretty dynamic host in the past. Uh, some of the Malaysia's hosting years, we've gotten a lot done at APEC. Are you in discussions now with Malaysia? Do you have a sense of what their priorities are going to be next year? Are they going to be particularly helpful in working on um, best practices uh, for, for, digital, for the digital economy? Um, uh, and, and also, another question, perhaps a separate question is, you know, APEC hasn't done a lot of work in infrastructure, um, but as an institution that does foster best practices, you know, this administration has not been shy about laying out a number of concerns about China's Belt and Road Initiative um, and, and as a, a number of ways that the Belt and Road Initiative does not adhere to best practices. Is APEC a laboratory for trying to formulate and um, um, support a set of best practices for infrastructure development for host countries? So, um, of course, China is an APEC economy. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but I think that when, that there is a good example of APEC being a laboratory for best practices. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Japan introduced the concept of quality infrastructure mm -hmm. into the APEC discussion, mm -hmm. and that's a topic that's received a, a fair amount of, of attention by the member economies mm -hmm. uh, over the years. It's something that we, the United States, are interested um, in. Mm -hmm. So I think on the topic of infrastructure, and in particular qual quality infrastructure, that, that's, an, that's an area that, that APEC has addressed and will continue to address. On the Malaysia topic, um, I believe that Malaysia is interested in carrying over a lot of the themes uh, mm -hmm. that Chile has embraced, um, including digital economy, uh, women's economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. the, the Really the key challenge or the, the key item on the to-do list for Malaysia's host year is developing the APEC post-2020 vision. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the, there's a whole lot of work gearing up to that already. Mm -hmm. APEC Vision Group has been meeting for the last several years. Mm -hmm. It'll release a, sort of a key stakeholder report um, at the leaders meeting in mm -hmm. November uh, of this year. That will be one of the many inputs into the post-2020 mm -hmm. vision. So I, I think for Malaysia, um, in addition to whatever themes mm -hmm. it adopts as you know, particular Malaysia themes for, mm -hmm. for APEC 2020, this issue of you know, APEC's vision going forward is going to be a crucial one. And from a U.S. government perspective, what, what does the United States really want, hope gets emphasized in this post-2020 vision? Well, I would say the United States would hope that the post-2020 vision incorporates what we see as the key value add for APEC, which is APEC as uh, an institution that allows a wide swath of economies, both mm -hmm. developed and developing, to d develop means to facilitate trade, to facilitate investment, 
and which goes back to your infrastructure point. Uh, infrastructure investment is some of the largest, most expensive, most complicated investment mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, if we can get the investment facilitation terms and standards right in APEC, mm -hmm. um, that will be an enormous push forward for our effort uh, broadly across the, across the Indo-Pacific. And what is the Trump administration's view on membership in APEC? Obviously, India has been knocking on the door. Uh, APEC does not currently have three of the ASEAN states as members, Laos, Cambodia, and uh, Myanmar. Um, is, there are obviously trade-offs to expanding membership in APEC. Um, is, there a, is, is the Trump administration taking a particular view going forward of how, how they would like to see APEC membership maintained or expanded? So I'm going to pull my only just, I only just started card on this okay. one. All right. Uh, I'm not, since we're speaking on the record, yes. I, I okay. will have to take that question back. Very good. Okay. Any other questions for Das Odkirk? Yes, one here, gentlemen. Here. Yeah, Ken Meyer-Court. Does our vision include uh, returning to the TPP? <laughs> no. Not yet. <laughs> that was an easy one for this administration. <laughs> okay, if they're not, if they're, oh, there's one more question over here. Hi, um, Jake Gerber from U.S. Intern at U.S. Treasury um, Office of Energy and Infrastructure, and I just want to understand um, how infrastructure will be discussed at APAC this year, in terms of you know being infrastructure such a big and costly investment, and how will it be dis be discussed? I'm sorry, I didn't. Infra how your, infrastructure? Your, your, your question isn't very audible. Oh, how will infrastructure be discussed at this year's APEC conference? So you mentioned the quality infrastructure right. discussion that Japan started. Mm -hmm. Is that a, you know, a, a channel of work uh, that will continue and that is the agenda for infrastructure or are there other ways to expand the infrastructure discussion to other in, into other parts of, you know, other, other discussions in APEC? So I'd say infrastructure comes up in a variety of different mm -hmm. fora, of, of course, because it, it infra, infrastructure underpins right. uh, work in a whole bunch of different areas, but the primary vehicle through which APEC discusses infrastructure right now is the Quality Infrastructure Initiative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you did mention digital economy, a real focus on digital economy in recent years, and Chile in particular is embracing it. Can you share with us what, if anything, APEC has accomplished on that front and what, and what you hope to move forward this year? So APEC is doing a lot of work um, on, so APEC is in the process of setting up the terms of reference for a digital economy steering group, which will sort of provide a framework for the sort of discussions of innovative ways to advance the digital economy. We're hoping that the, that the digital economy steering group will be up and running um, by leaders this year. Um, the United States has um, uh, proposed and we've gotten 11 other economies to sign on to a digital economy pathfinder, which is a, the pathfinder is a, 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 a subgrouping within APEC, so not all of the APEC economies need to sign on in order to progress discussions there. But generally, I think looking at digital economy, we're looking at ways that the digital economy can be leveraged to mm -hmm. facilitate trade, mm -hmm. more so than investment. I think it's really the trade agenda there. Mm -hmm. And that means um, labeling standards. It means ensuring that micro, small, and medium enterprises have access uh, to markets through the digital economy, mm -hmm. that um, regulation doesn't inadvertently uh, become so onerous that small businesses um, you know, can't participate. Uh, it includes things that vary from you know, cross-border privacy regulations mm -hmm. to custom standards to, like, like I said before, labeling. It's, it's a very broad area, but it's an area that as we look forward to a more digitally enabled economy worldwide, it's crucial that we get right. Great. Well, I, I want to uh, thank uh, Des Oakirk. Mm -hmm. I mean, APEC is a very unusual organization. Their <laughs> economy is not members. There aren't really rules or legal agreements. It's all about norm building and yeah. 
best practices, and there's all kinds of different agenda within APEC and work streams and vision plans. And so it's very difficult to sort of understand what APEC is, but your answers were uh, very succinct and crystal clear, and I think you helped us a lot today understand what APEC is doing and, uh, and, and how the Trump administration sees APEC within their broader economic strategy. So with that, please join me in thanking Des O'Kirk for her remarks. Thank you so much. And let me ask the panel to come up on stage. Nigel, if you want to sit here, okay. I think we're going to Okay, <laughs> terrific. Well, we're going to move right into our panel of experts uh, that we've assembled, and I'm, I'm very excited about this group, uh, this grouping. Let me briefly introduce the panelists, and then I'll turn to each of them to offer some remarks and their perspectives. Um, uh, to my left, I have uh, Dr. Phyllis Yoshida, who is a Senior Fellow for Energy and Technology at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. And prior to joining Sasakawa USA, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia, Europe, and the Americas at the US Department of Energy, where she also was lead Sherpa for the uh, energy uh, work within APEC, which she will, I'm sure, tell us all about. Um, next to Dr. Yoshida, we have um, Nigel Hearn, who has been president of Asia Pacific Exploration and Production um, of, of Chevron since March 1, 2019, where he oversees nine countries across the Asia Pacific region. Previously, he served as managing director of Chevron Australia uh, Party Limited uh, until March of this year. Um, next to him, we have Brian Churchill, who is a White House fellow placed at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, known as OPIC, um, where he currently le co-leads the agency's Indo-Pacific team. He was previously with the Los Angeles Police Department, um, uh, and he concurrently serves as an officer in the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve. Um, so, very interesting um, resume. But he's here to tell us about OPIC and the through the Build Act, the designs to sort of refashion OPIC um, into a larger expanded entity. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Peter Raymond, who's a senior associate with the Simon Chair in Political Economy and the Reconnecting Asia Project here at CSIS. Um, and he uh, has also served as global advisory leader of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Capital Projects and Infrastructure Practice. So uh, both Peter and Nigel bring uh, really helpful perspectives from the private sector. Um, but let me begin uh, with Phyllis. We just heard about APEC from the new <coughs> senior official for APEC mm -hmm. at the State Department. You have many, many years of experience in yeah. APEC. And if you could share with us your views of what APEC does in um, in the field of energy cooperation. Uh, that would be very helpful. OK, let me add to what we just heard, uh, perhaps from a slightly different perspective. Uh, but maybe first, just to frame my remarks, I've always thought it's very important when the US government undertakes these types of big initiatives that they try to ground them as much as possible in uh, what, what should I say, regional governance. Mm -hmm. So that would be to ground them in an existing forum, if possible. Uh, APEC, ASEAN, Lower Mekong Initiative, the various things that we do with India. Uh, so that those goals and tenets, as you sort of switch from one administration to another, have a home and hopefully can keep building and growing and uh, permeating throughout the region. Uh, the other reason that's important, APEC is always been extremely good, and I've been involved in APEC since actually the year it was founded in 1989. Uh, at that wow. point, I was doing science and technology at, uh, at the Commerce Department, and uh, we built up a group of uh, people interested in science issues, and that now I think there are about seven working groups doing what our one working group was actually doing back in 1989-1990. Uh, uh, but as we just heard, uh, 
I served as lead shepherd for Energy and APEC for about nine years until I retired. Uh, Chinese Taipei has since uh, taken on that role and is doing quite a good job. Yeah. But while, why we found it useful was really that you can touch many different economies in APEC countries, otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. at one time. Uh, the Energy Department would not have uh, really the resources, say, to deal with you know, a Vietnam very much or a Papua New Guinea. But within APEC, you can pull the senior leaders in energy together uh, and really then have their institutions to start implementing things. Uh, the other reason it's very useful, and I should say the energy working group at one point, at least before I retired, we had more projects than any other group in APEC, including trade and investment. Uh, and I'll get to that, the reason why that's important. Uh, so we used, really, the Energy Working Group to develop a common understanding of what the energy issues were in the region, what issues were facing the region over the long term, uh, to come up with goals that we could all agree to. And often when APEC, you see a goal sitting out there, it's a goal for APEC, but what we found was often the energy ministries would then try to implement that goal at a national level. So you'd actually have a whole lot more leverage than it would appear. And then training, I think as we've just heard earlier, one of the mm. biggest things that we can do either as US government or within APEC is really train people on regulations, be it for you know, nuclear power plants or be it for energy and power markets. Uh, it's a good place to do that and do it as a group. Or even things that perhaps again sound sort of uh, silly to many people, but things like how do you collect energy statistics? What is the proper way to do that? How do you know really what's going on in your economy? So there are all sorts of these sort of, but another version of infrastructure perhaps uh, that APEC took on. So APEC was particularly robust, I think, within the region in terms of its ability to do these things because it actually undertook projects. Um, to go back, most people I think hear of APEC and they think of trade and investment. In reality, when leaders set up APEC, it was set up as having three stools. One was trade, one was investment, and the other was something that's called ecotech now, but really is sort of technical cooperation. And that third stool gets a lot less, I think, attention than the first two. Uh, so maybe I would ask you to see what you can do about raising the... Uh, visibility of some of the other things that are going on. Uh, and energy really fell within that ecotech leg. Uh, so the role really was to how do you maximize the energy sector's contribution to the region's economic growth and well-being while at the same time mitigating environmental effects. And that's been true of sort of what was given to the energy working group starting in 1990. Uh, goals that the US managed to get put into the energy working group and put into the leader's statements that are still there are, one was to double the share of renewables by 2030 over what it was in 2014, to reduce energy intensity by 45% by 2035 over what it was in 2005. And APEC was the first international organization to have goals like that, which is another reason it's sort of a pathfinder. Other mm -hmm. places uh, picked those up since. Uh, we probably had done nearly, by now, 500 projects within the Energy Working Group, uh, some better than others. That was one of the things we worked very hard on was to sort of raise the quality of projects. Uh, but we did peer reviews, for example. We would put together groups of experts within APEC and send them to different economies to look at energy efficiency policy and regulations, to look at uh, low carbon cities, to look at several different things, uh, look at uh, something we're probably not doing anymore because the US had been funding it, uh, uh, how to uh, get rid of uh, fossil fuel subsidies, for example. Um, so we're very well known for peer reviews. 
uh, expert, we had sub-expert groups on energy efficiency, renewables, clean fossil fuels, um, energy resilience is one of the most recent things that the group has been looking at. Uh, task forces, which were meant to be time limited, where you would choose something that maybe you needed to look at for three years, but unlike energy efficiency, wasn't something that you were going to be looking at for many, many, many years. So, really, the, these governance, including APEC, of course, I think are a good place for the US government to put resources and to put more resources than we have in the past in terms of implementing things like Asia Edge. The reason that we could do so much in the energy working group was because the government of Japan thought ahead and set up an actual funding mechanism specifically for energy projects. And it made a huge difference. Some of the other Ecotech groups would maybe do two or three projects a year. We would do 10 or more. Uh, we would have peer reviews, which the other ones couldn't. And it was all because of a relatively small amount of money, you know, just a very few couple million dollars or more that had been put in this special fund so that we could do projects. Uh, Japan also put money into and set up a research institute with about 25 people that specifically supported the energy working group. China has since done another small research institute, and those were invaluable in terms of, I think, getting what Japan wanted done in the region in place, because they had, were presenting the resources, and luckily the US sort of always agreed with what Japan wanted to do, so we leveraged all of that. But that, you had asked if there's something that we could do more of to take mm -hmm. advantage of these opportunities, is just to really, you know, put the types of resources into the ecotech leg um, and do more. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Asia, Asia Edge, it really is, I think, a positive development to show commitment to the region. And I think that's extraordinarily important after we pulled out of TPP. I'm not sure it's quite enough by itself to sort of make up for some of the ill will that was felt after that, but it's a good step forward, especially as we institutionalize some of the pieces. I think also it's important that we recognize that we really can't compete with China on sort of the infrastructure funding. It's just so enormous. In fact, we can't even compete with Japan on the amount they put into infrastructure funding. But to really find those areas of leverage that make sense and to really get our values across. And I'll be very interested in hearing where we are with build and with the uh, sort of re structuring of uh, our fin export financing groups, because that's extraordinarily important. I was very glad to hear some of the specific projects that are being picked up, because I think up to now it's still been sort of vague, because it's been, like you said, in coordinating internally, which means the outside is a little opaque. What is it that we're actually going to work on? Um, and I'm glad to see that it's picking up some of the existing projects uh, that we had worked on with PACE with India and with others and just take advantage and sort of revitalize and keep those moving in a new direction. I guess the only, maybe the last thing I would say is that uh, we've heard a lot about LNG. LNG is important, uh, but it's also, there's a lot that's just going to happen anyway by the private sector just because of the way markets are going to happen. Uh, it's certainly important to work on uh, making sure the sort of rules of the game as it becomes an international commodity or a global commodity like oil are correct. Uh, but it's also important to remember that the countries in the region really do look at a diversified portfolio of energy. Uh, you know, maybe we're not so interested in renewables, but a lot of these countries, that's a, still extremely important to them. So great to have sort of the short, shorter term LNG work, even more important to do things like electrification, still work with renewables, et cetera, throughout the whole region as we move forward. So partnerships, I think, like APEC are indispensable, really to getting things done. Often we, as the US sort of plow in and think we're gonna have this new big thing and don't bother to ground it in the existing institutions in the region, which can keep moving long after perhaps an administration changes. Thank you, Phyllis, that was really terrific. Um, 
Now that we're on Asia Edge, Nigel, let me turn to you and, and, and ask you to share with us from a private sector perspective, um, how do you understand Asia Edge as an opportunity uh, for, you, for the U.S. private sector, and, um, and, and, and what, 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 what do you hope to hear more of from the U.S. government as this initiative sort of unfolds? Well, so first, uh, thank you, Amy, for the opportunity to speak. Um, welcome um, to everybody who's here today. And thank you to CSSI, CSIS, our long-term partners. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate your commitment mm -hmm. and wide-ranging around wide-ranging efforts that change lives for the better. Uh, that includes this dialogue. And that's what I would like to hear more about today. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't detected, I'm not from these shores. <laughs> um, I'm also not Australian, having worked in Australia. Um, I'm often confused. I'm a Welshman. Um, I'm from a small country. Wales is in the UK. I'm a proud Welshman. Um, if you don't know what Wales is famous for, it's famous for its rugby. Mm -hmm. A Rugby World Cup will be in Japan this year, first time in an Asian country, which I'm looking forward to visiting. <laughs> so I will give you a bit of kudos. Um, as a rugby ex-rugby player, uh, I can tell you only the promise of the pub after a game would bring a scrum like this together. <laughs> and in our agile world, a scrum is kind of the new uh, vogue phrase to talk about. So um, a scrum is a lesson in diplomacy. Uh, it's when we all put our arms around each other, put our heads down when, with real focus and lots of energy. Uh, that's not a pun. Uh, we move the ball forward. So I'm looking forward to this scrum today. Mm -hmm. I do think there's an opportunity to move the ball forward with government's Indo-Pacific strategy, um, which Secretary Pompeo announced last year. The opportunity is in front of us um, to give the Indo-Pacific strategy a victory, uh, put some victory on the board, and just one of many, I hope. And here's a few things I think we can do. We've talked about some of them already this morning. First, focus on energy security for Asian nations. And we can do this by channeling innovation, innovation that's unlocked natural gas resources here in the United States. Uh, second, we need to create the right environments for partnerships between companies, governments, governments to governments that will harness the potential of natural gas. That will enable energy security. Third, we need the Indo-Pacific funds to build the right infrastructure to support natural gas deliveries to the markets and countries that need energy the most. So here's why, and I think this is really our calling. The world needs energy. Billions of people today can't access reliable energy. About a third of the world's population, two and a half billion people, cook with biomass like wood and animal dung. According to the World Health Organization, effects from breathing smoke claims the lives of one and a half million people every year. That's half a million more people than live here in Fairfax, Fairfax County. In the next 20 years, there will be 1.4 million billion more people in the world. They will have as much right as anybody to the benefits of affordable, reliable, and cleaner energy. They'll want what we take for granted, to enjoy a warm home, to cook a family meal without inhaling toxins, to see their children read at night after dark so they can study and learn and thrive. Safe, reliable, and affordable energy opens the door to education, sanitation, and healthcare. It opens the door to progress, to human progress. We can work together to provide the energy that provides people, that improves people's lives. Our industry sees this as our calling or our noble cause. So here's what we're doing. We're enabling access to cleaner energy resources through natural gas. In Australia, Chevron and its partners are shipping a cargo of liquefied natural gas every 24 hours. And to put that in context, one cargo of natural gas will supply enough electricity to power 80,000 Tokyo homes for an entire year. That energy is going to consumers in Asia, where demand is growing the fastest. The Indo-Pacific strategy is well positioned. It's pointed exactly where we see energy demand booming. In China, natural gas consumption is growing on average 13% a year. India, Pakistan, and the burgeoning economies of Southeast Asia are leaping forward. And by 2023, LNG shipments will grow by a third from where they were in 2017. The vast majority of those ships are destined for Asian ports. 
With the Indo-Pacific strategy, the U.S. can help enable the future energy security of Asian nations by using the following and very simple model. So let's start with the needs of the customer instead of the resource or the rock. That's a hard thing for a, a uh, oil and gas person to say, so I'll repeat it. Let's start with the customers instead of the resource. <laughs> let's work together instead of going alone. And let's start with integrated gas through LNG. So why LNG is our focus? Because we know it works. There's a terrific model right here in North America. I worked for three years in Pennsylvania's Appalachian Basin, where I saw that business firsthand. Today, cargoes of LNG are moving from the Gulf Coast to Asia. And that's without building pipelines. I can see a time when Appalachian gas finds its way to Asia too. And there are some simple reasons why that works. North America's natural gas system is superbly interconnected. Beyond these shores, ships, LNG ships, become natural gas pipelines on water. That's how we connect markets. Ships are the key to moving us beyond domestic gas to a global integrated gas system through LNG. And here's the other thing that's key about North America. Companies, communities, and governments are working together to make the system work. Every partner in North America's system is motivated by one goal, serving the customer. The resulting flexibility, transparency, and efficiency have produced a system that's flourishing today. Government, communities, and companies share a common vision. And the system is only getting more efficient, more affordable, and cleaner. In the US, natural gas has been largely responsible for lowering energy-related CO2 emissions by 14% since 2005. The Department of Energy attributes almost two-thirds of that to, to the increase of, of natural gas consumption. That's more than 80 times the impact of penetration by electric vehicles. People in Asia Pacific and elsewhere are taking notice. They are beginning to see more flexible, efficient, and creative agreements to best serve the Asian markets too. We can energize Asia. But to do so, each of us has a role to play. We need to make cleaner energy solutions attractive. And industry is prepared to use its ingenuity and skills to find the right partners to address the challenges that host governments and customers face. Asian economies must create the right climate to welcome foreign direct investment in the energy sector. Government can help by enabling access to capital for infrastructure like ports, regas facilities, distribution centers, and Asia Edge is a ter terrific starting point to doing just that. The BUILD Act also moves us in the right direction. We just need the commitment and the collective focus on energy security. Your collaboration, resources, influence, and commitment can help us be more creative and influential in energizing Asia. Last year's announcement by Secretary Pompeo was a great start. Let's go back to the scrum. It's now time to move the ball forward. Let's deliver the Indo-Pacific strategy, its very first victory of many. And I'll leave you with the last quote by Michelangelo. The danger lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting it too low and hitting the mark. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to aim high. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me now uh, turn um, to Brian to give us a view uh, from OPIC. And we're all eagerly waiting to see the emergence of OPIC 2.0, uh, the IDFC, yeah. if I have that right, um, what it's going to look like, uh, how you're going to uh, combine various authorities and tools in, in, that are currently in different government agencies into one agency. We, we've heard about the budget. How are decisions going to be made in terms of uh, funding projects? Is it going to be on a just a, 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 a wide range sort of global scale based on bankable projects or is there going to be a strategic focus? Uh, a lot of questions that I hope you can uh, help us begin to answer. Yeah, so. Definitely, thank you. And thank you for having me yes. here. 
Uh, this is probably one of the most exciting times in government where we get to actually stand up a completely new agency with new tools and with, with mm -hmm. that strategic focus to make American businesses more competitive around the world. So let, let, me, let me start by telling you what OPIC is, because there's probably a lot, of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of questions in the audience. We're not OPEC. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And we essentially do three things, which is uh, financing of, of individual projects, like, like a wind farm in Sulawesi. Uh, we offer political risk insurance. Uh, this is for uh, r insurance against expropriation or currency and convertibility, things like that. And the third thing that we do is support uh, with, through debt financing to private equity funds. So those are our three major channels as of right now. That's going to change uh, October 1st as a result of the BUILD Act. So the BUILD Act was signed uh, by the President last uh, uh, October, October 5th actually, and it was overwhelmingly supported by the Senate and, and, and by the House, uh, bipartisan support for this. Uh, development finance is, is uh, hugely important all around the world, and, and I, I think that you can see through that bipartisan support the importance that our, our government has to it. So we're going to add some additional capabilities. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to have an equity authority. Uh, we're taking an arm from uh, USAID, the Development Credit Authority, mm -hmm. and we're bringing them into the, in, into the fold. We're going to be called the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. Colloquially, we're going to call it the DFC. Oh, the DFC. So uh, mm -hmm. in addition to that equity authority, we currently have an exposure cap that is $29 billion. Uh, that exposure cap is going to raise up to $60 billion. We are going to be given the ability to do technical assistance and feasibility studies. And uh, we, we have a broader alignment with the rest of government. So when I talk about that broader alignment, uh, let me talk specifically about our Indo-Pacific strategy. So last fall, uh, we did a, a, a big survey of, of the whole of government throughout the interagency. We actually talked with 22 different external players within the government. And, and that was to better align our, our policies, our strategies, and what we're doing to make sure that, that we are aligned. And, and so the three sectors where, where we concentrate on business development and where we align ourselves are with energy, infrastructure, and digital communications. Sounds pretty familiar, mm -hmm. right? So being aligned with that allows us to, to look at things through that strategic lens, because those are all sectors that are vitally important. And having an Indo-Pacific focus uh, within the agency uh, allows our, our business development efforts to, to look at those strategic networks, those strategic uh, sectors within the market so, so that we are the most effective development finance tool that the world has ever seen. In building that, our president and CEO, uh, Dave Bohegan, has really taken uh, a, a very broad, systematic approach to how the, the policies and how, how this agency is going to be shaped. What he did was he talked with uh, other development finance institutions around the world, from our partners in Europe to uh, Japan to uh, multilateral uh, development banks, and, and took their best practices and looked how we can apply those to the DFC. Uh, we've got very broad engagement with the rest of the government. Uh, with the DFC, the chairman of the board is going to be the Secretary of State. So obviously that right there brings us into the, the government fold a little more tightly than, than we have been under OPIC. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he's talked with civil society. We, we've talked with uh, previous OPIC uh, heads, previous OPIC employees, and there's been a lot of internal engagement throughout OPIC from uh, the deal teams to the different uh, departments within, making sure that, that as we set this up, we are effective, we are efficient, and we are poised to, to do what our mission is, which is to, to make people's lives better, to, to bring impact into the uh, into the people that need it the most around the world. So we are excited about that. Our projects, uh, we're going to view them through the same lens that we view now. Our projects will not infringe on the sovereignty of foreign nations. 
our projects are built sustainable. They're built to last and they're, they're, they're bankable. Our projects are transparent from tender to operations and maintenance. Our projects look at uh, environmental uh, implications and our projects look at labor. We want to use uh, local labor as, as, most as, we, as, as most and as best as we can and uh, the, the rights of the workers are, are obviously a, a definite factor when, when we look at, at what projects and investments we participate in. And that's going to continue forward with the DFC. And again, you know, this, this is very exciting. Uh, come October 1st, uh, OPIC is going to go away completely, and, and you'll see new logos, the DFC, where we're <laughs> going to be highly engaged all around the world. So again, it's very exciting for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn uh, finally to Peter um, to share your perspectives from a private sector, a former private sector um, position uh, in terms of, you know, how, how, do you, how do these initiatives add up to, in your mind in terms of making a difference on the ground on infrastructure development in particular in Southeast Asia? Thanks, Amy, and my pleasure to be part of this panel. And I was excited, as excited as anyone, to hear Brian speak about the, uh, the future of DFC because I think it's something many in the private sector are really looking at with great interest. You know, I think it's important to, to maybe to step back a little bit and 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 try to view the Indo-Pacific strategy um, in the context of um, of uh, a competition, which mm -hmm. in many ways it is, with China's Belt and Road yeah. Initiative. And when we, when we look at it from that perspective, um, it, it, you, it, it emerges that really it, it may be a contest between industrial policy and industrial policy tools and resources versus a free market approach to development of economies and businesses um, in the region. And um, we all know from history that um, industrial policies uh, tend to get things done quickly and at large scale. Um, but they have, they carry with them risks that uh, mm -hmm. uh, Das mm -hmm. and Kirk had mentioned, which are, um, you know, inefficiencies, mm -hmm. potential for corruption, mm -hmm. overinvestment in certain areas as well. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen certainly in the West um, and throughout uh, many parts of the world is that when the private economies work competitively, when you have an ability to compete for projects and mobilize finance in an efficient way, you get a more efficient outcome, you get projects that are more sustainable over time, you get higher quality projects and mm -hmm. the like. Um, so I think uh, though we have a situation where many countries in the region um, are being almost compelled to choose between something that they can get quickly yeah. at a large scale versus an alternative which may ultimately be, be better but will take several years to, to develop. And that is a very difficult choice for policymakers, governments, and business partners um, around the world. Uh, but I don't think that the U.S. needs, and there's no indication that the U.S. Is, is intending to develop its own industrial policy. But I do think that there are three areas very, uh, of very important support that can come from the U.S. government in this contest, if you will. And these are signaling, direct support, and tools. And so uh, let me just talk about each of those. From a signaling perspective, I think the US over the past year has done a really interesting job, and not just the US, but Japan, Australia, Europe, and other countries around the world, around the importance for quality, transparent infrastructure development, effective, efficient, competitive procurement processes, mm -hmm. and, the, and the differences that result when you use these methods and approaches. This has been, I think, very important, and I think we have seen it have an impact in the past 12 months in terms of countries in the region reconsidering deals that they have been negotiating, um, stepping back from those deals and saying, hey, we want um, perhaps a different set of terms and conditions, or we want greater transparency around how this project is gonna unfold and how we're gonna be able to afford to repay. Um, the loans that we're taking on this project. So I think signaling is very important, but an, um, an important part of that signaling is the issue of commitment. And I think in the region, when I speak with uh, policymakers, government officials, private uh, investors, there's still a little uncertainty about the level of commitment that the U.S. is willing to make 
to the Indo-Pacific. And, and while there has been a lot going on, and we've heard that there's a lot going on in, the, in, in Washington, and now some of these uh, activities are being rolled out, the mixed signals around uh, you know, trade, um, TPP, uh, you know, other things, America First, have made people a little uncertain where, where the U.S. is going. And so I applaud, uh, again, the comments of uh, Das Odkirk and others, the establishment of the DFC, et cetera. These are, these are clear signals about longer-term commitments to the region, which I think are very important. So signaling is very important. Mm -hmm. The second is, is support. And, um, and we've heard a bit now about support in terms of project identification, project preparation, project procurement processes. These are all really critical. You know, which projects are the best projects to do? How do you develop and prepare those projects in a way in which the private sector can come and have a competitive procurement around? How do you manage and run those procurements? These are, um, these are essential to unlocking the power of uh, the private sector to deliver uh, these projects. But also there is uh, an element of advocacy that I think is important when you look at kind of the competitive forces at play. And the U.S. government's ability to advocate for um, U.S.-based or Western-based approaches to project development at the project level is really important. Now, there have been some great examples uh, both inside the region and outside the region where U.S. advocacy has made a difference and has helped governments make let's say more transparent, not always deciding for a U.S. alternative or a Western alternative, but certainly stepping back from um, making a decision uh, a little too uh, aggressively, if you will. So advocacy at the embassy level, the Foreign Commercial Service, other, other ways in which the U.S. can, can really stand strong behind uh, this approach. I think that's really important. And finally, tools. Um, so we have um, a, an array of tools that we can bring to bear, and we've heard about them from Brian at DFC, which is terrific. Uh, but there are other tools, our um, relationships with our allies um, and mm -hmm. partners like Japan and Australia. Mm -hmm. Japan has committed some $200 billion in funding for infrastructure in the region. Um, how, in effect, are we are we turning that kind of commitment that Japan has made in combination with the Asian Development Bank and the U.S.? So let's have some demonstrations of how that works and how the U.S. government can help bring U.S. companies together with Japanese companies and others to bring uh, that money to bear. Um, and most importantly, we heard earlier about uh, $70 trillion in, in um, financial assets that are under management. There are, there are other estimates, but it is a massive amount of money unlocking that private sector capital is really going to be the secret to effective and efficient and broad-based infrastructure development, not only in the Asia-Pacific region, but around the world. And actually, DFC has the potential to help accelerate that through not just its current risk mitigation instruments, but new instruments that it could develop in concert with financial resources and financial centers in the United States and elsewhere around the world. So I think we really need to, to focus on unlocking those, uh, those uh, sources of financing and bringing them to projects that are properly structured and executed um, and procured. So these are the things that, that, um, that, that businesses and governments uh, raised to me in my conversations and to many others in terms of how do we take a great idea the Indo-Pacific strategy and some of the resources of the Indo-Pacific strategy and really turn them into action on the ground. Thank you so much. Um, l let me start our discussion by, uh, I think I'll turn first to, to Brian. Um, really exciting. Uh, who knew OPEC was going to be such an exciting topic? But um, <laughs> really exciting to, to hear the latest update of, of how the DFC is, is going to develop, how it's going to emerge. Um, I think there's still some questions in the region. Well, let me step back and say, when I traveled in the regions not long after Secretary Pompeo made his announcements last July with certain price tags attached to the various initiatives that were announced, there was a sense of being very underwhelmed uh, because, you know, because of our competition. Uh, you know, China goes around the region with probably inflated but massively large 
uh, dollar signs or, or yuan signs attached to its initiatives. And Japan, as has been mentioned, has put a lot of its resources behind infrastructure initiatives. So, you know, when, when the total of initiatives initially was announced in the hundreds of millions of dollars, the Chinese sort of poked fun at that, and many in the region were rather underwhelmed, as well as uh, left with questions about what the initiatives were really going to look like, where was the rubber going to meet the road, how, what difference was it going to make, because there were, still were not as many you know, spe specifics attached to some of these initiatives. But when the announcement of the Build Act came along with the $60 billion price tag, doubling OPIC's resources, um, along with other tools in the toolbox, um, that was meaningful. And I got a lot of real positive feedback on the potential. And yet, I think there's still questions about what it's going to mean, particularly for Southeast Asia, which has been in many ways the main battleground, if we want to put it in that terms, between countries really feeling like they have, they have a lot of attention from China, a lot of opportunities through uh, partnering in Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but as, as Peter mentioned, they want you know, they want alternatives. Um, they want, they, they're, it's, it's, it's very difficult and they're not really interested in walking away from everything that China has to offer, but they're also looking for alternatives that um, uh, come with less strings attached, are better quality, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, but the question is, is, can they really take the $60 billion price tag that's out there and think a lot of this is gonna come to Southeast Asia? Or is it going to be just sort of equally dispersed across the globe because there's infrastructure needs everywhere. Um, and the Belt and Road is expanding by the day, more and more countries. So if it's if the impulse is to compete with the Belt and Road, then you'll be in Latin America, you'll be in Africa, you'll be in Europe, you know, you'll be all over the globe. So I know that it's probably hard to give any specifics at this stage in time. But if you were talking to a Southeast Asian audience, uh, what would you what would you say to them about how much or you know, to what degree are these new resources and tools going to be used to provide more alternatives to countries in this particular region? Sure, thank you. And, and the, the, the most important thing we have to realize is that we are not a, a nation that relies upon state-owned enterprises to, to do development. We look at private sector, market-driven response. And so while the, the government's price tag for these initiatives might seem under, underwhelming, when you look at the total stock of U.S. foreign direct investment in the region, it's massive. And that's truly where our soft power exists, is mm -hmm. right there. So our objective at the DFC is to, is to make sure that we're catalyzing private sector investment in the region. Now, we are global. Uh, we, we operate in lower to lower middle income countries all over the world. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is vitally important, but it's one of several vitally important areas around the world. Mm -hmm. it's, my, uh, it's my focus, so to, to me it's the most important, <laughs> but there, there are other people at the DFC that have, have focuses in Latin America, focuses in Africa, focuses in uh, Central, uh, Central Asia. So uh, the, these things are, are obviously of critical importance. One of the parts of our strategy is partnerships. So you'll see that uh, back in, I believe it was January of 2018, we signed an MOU with uh, JBIC, uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, and just last November, we signed a trilateral MOU with uh, both Australia and Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and building these sorts of partnerships, these coalitions of, of like-minded nations that adhere to the highest standards are absolutely essential to our strategy because we are not state-owned enterprise where we pick our national champions and plug them into to an area. We need bankable deals. We need sustainable deals. We need, to, we need to protect the people on the ground and the sovereignty of these nations. And so when we look at our partners, we, we, we see that they, they share those same values with us and that it, it's critical for us to work with our partners in the area. We've also signed MOUs with, uh, with Singapore, with their Infrastructure mm -hmm. Asia and with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, that both happened uh, mm -hmm. just a couple months ago. So building that network of partnerships around the globe of like-minded people so that we're all doing development for, for, for the reasons of impact and for the reasons of, of truly making the world a better place. That's our focus. Yes, uh, Peter, you want to add something to this? If I might ask Please. Brian a question. Sure. Uh, so Brian, translate that if you could 
um, if you're able to share. It. What's the pipeline look like? Mm -hmm. How many projects okay. do you have in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. What's the potential value of those projects? Can you share any of that data with us? Because I, th I think you've laid a great foundation, and I think the market is saying, okay, great. But when's yes. the first signing, right? When's That's the first it. signing? Yeah. So the first signing's coming, and it's going to be great. Everybody <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> so, Stay tuned. But uh, a lot of this, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we have business confidentiality. Yep. So mm -hmm. I, I can't exactly share with you what's in the pipeline, but uh, in the coming months, you're going to see deals that align directly with the three initiatives. You're going to see deals that, that really create that impact that we're looking for and, and, and that you're going to see. So uh, I'm not going to share with you what, what I can't share with you, okay. but we, we do have a very robust pipeline and, and our, our private sector partners are, are right there with us. Uh, and and we, we will do whatever we can to make sure that they are fully supported in, uh, in that development. So is it safe to say that you have capacity uh, within the $60 billion limit, you still have some capacity left for projects, so if uh, people listening to this uh, panel have projects, they can uh, start uh, approaching uh, OPEC and, and DFC and, and say, let's, uh, let's see if we can put something together. Please, that's an excellent point, and, and yes, if. If you have projects that you're interested in, <laughs> please don't hesitate to contact us. You, you, our, our website, opec.gov, is still open. We are we're going to be setting up our DFC website uh, within the next few months. But right now, opec.gov is where to find it, and and we we will we will bend over backward with our, our agency to make sure that uh, that your your projects are supported. So uh, Brian, I have one. <laughs> this is great. This I don't is, have to do it. I don't want to do it. Please. So, you know, joke, joking apart, yeah. I, I think if you look at how energy companies, you, you talk about partnerships and collaboration, I think the real value is when we get the partnership right. Because mm -hmm. I, I can envisage a project where, you know, we talk about supplying LNG. Traditionally, LNG has gone to markets that are very mature. They have very mature infrastructure, very mature businesses. Mm -hmm. The new emer emerging markets aren't the same. But I can envisage a solution where energy providers from North America are partnering with Japanese utility providers to provide both renewable and power generation through natural gas to complement, not to compete, in emerging markets that don't offer the same first year benefits that some of these premium prior countries have had LNG. So to me, that's the kind of creative things that we need to be offering as a solution. And it's an entire solution, not an LNG solution or a renewable solution, it's, you know, when, when you were talking about affordable, reliable, clean energy, if you don't have affordable energy, no matter how reliable, how clean it is, as the consumer, that really matters. If you can't afford it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, if it's affordable but not reliable, and the more you put the three of those together, the more beneficial I think we're going to be to some of these host countries. So that to me is the opportunity space. I'll come see you later yeah, about opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's that partnership with other financial institutions um, who offer the same kind of service that you're doing mm. that I, I think in region will, and particularly government to government relationships will provide some value. Mm. That's the sweet spot we have to find, I think. Let me ask uh, Phyllis a question. Um, you, we've heard a lot about Asia Edge today, yeah. uh, but um, and, and you're no longer in government. Um, but if you were in government, if you were playing a lead role in Asia mm -hmm. Edge, I mean, what would what would you be pushing for to, that you think would be would really make a difference in terms of catalyzing private sector investment, in particular um, parts of the industry, promoting energy security, uh, et cetera? I mean, is, is is it adding up from what you're hearing? Is it adding up? to the right set of policies, or are there missing ingredients that you're still waiting to hear? I think we're still out? waiting to hear more about it over the next year, so it's hard to speak too specifically about it. But uh, certainly all of government, and when I read about it, uh, the, the whole issue of diversification is there. And if uh, implementation can hold to that diversification, both the diversification types of fuels, diversification and types of um, infrastructure that you're looking at, mm -hmm. it's very important. Uh, in the past, and I'm not saying this about Asia Edge, but you know, I was in the government, you know, 35 years. Uh, we would often go in with the solution. You know, USAID would go in. This is the solution. 
and that often didn't work very well, <laughs> which is perhaps one reason I think embedding something in an APEC or elsewhere, even if it's still you know the U.S. initiative, but taking pieces where other countries can have mm -hmm. some say or also get some buy-in. Uh, you talked about having reach goals. One thing in APEC that we always had trouble with was uh, sort of taking that U.S. principle that, you know, you know as scientists, et cetera, you, you, you know you can get to here, but let's try to get to here in terms of setting the goal. That was not something Southeast Asians do. Mm -hmm. You know, you set the goal, it's something you know you can achieve, right? <laughs> you don't get that reach goal but we managed to get them increasingly to look at reach goals for energy. Hmm. So rather than going in and with the peer reviews, we would actually make the country itself mm -hmm. uh, put all the background information together, et cetera, as opposed to pay a US consultant to come in and do it. Hmm. And we found that gave that buy-in to the initiative, the buy-in to the pieces that were really necessary for long-term mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Both policy and Peter, you want to add I, I just wanted to add something about APEC, which mm -hmm. um, uh, might not have been um, highlighted uh, sufficiently coming from an infrastructure perspective, and that is that um, a number of years ago, uh, APEC created a uh, financial instruments and financial tools workforce mm -hmm. um, uh, working group to, uh, to look at how um, changes in regulations uh, might affect the ability to mobilize some of the capital that we've talked about, um, the you know, tens of trillions of, uh, or hundreds of trillions of uh, dollars in, in uh, institutional capital that's available. And they've made some considerable progress. And, and so there is a, that's a great forum where um, an exchange between um, you know, the, the, the nations of, uh, sorry, the economies of APEC have, uh, has resulted in some, some material recommendations for um, legal regulatory changes that would stimulate greater investment in infrastructure. So I think there's a ground, uh, some groundwork that we could build on there. Can I follow right. up, Peter, with you on this? Uh, because this was one of the most interesting points you made, I think, that there are these massive resources in private uh, sector investment, pension funds, et cetera, uh, institutional investors. Are there things that the U.S. government could do to, uh, you know, perhaps um, through the DFC or perhaps through other channels to help unlock those resources? Yeah, I think it really comes down to risk mitigation. And, um, and, and there are a number of ways to mitigate risk in infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. yeah. which Nigel could pitch in a lot here as well. Yeah. Um, but, but one of them comes down to project preparation and packaging, right? So mm -hmm. how, how well is that project prepared so you know what you're getting into, okay? And we've heard a little bit about uh, the, some of those instruments that uh, the U.S. government can bring to bear uh, around that. But then you get into financing risks and you have currency issues and you have commercial mm -hmm. risk issues and you have political risk issues and these sorts of things. And amongst institutional investors, you also have constraints about we're an OECD only focused um, you know, resource pool, uh, or we can't mm -hmm. take uh, these kinds of currency risks, mm -hmm. or we can't take first loss risks if we're an insurer. And, and these are the areas where some additional focus, I think, uh, and the resources of DFC could step in and say, okay, look, at, we're, we're going to um, work on mm -hmm. maybe a first loss uh, risk mitigation instrument or a currency um, exchange risk mitigation instrument that will reduce the risks and then meet the threshold of um, these institutional investors. And I think the institutional investors, frankly, would be willing to move a little bit closer mm -hmm. if they saw that there was the U.S. government underwriting some of the risks associated mm -hmm. with these transactions. Mm -hmm. So I think we're at a, a really propitious moment where, where we've got an institution now in the U.S. Yeah. that can really focus on this. Yeah. And of course, we have the, the greatest, strongest, deepest, and most innovative capital markets in the world here in the United States, um, and a lot of assets that are looking for infrastructure-like uh, returns. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, a, it's a great moment, and uh, it's all on your shoulders. Phyllis, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you have something to add? Yeah, well, I was just gonna just draw us back a little bit to the concept of partnerships in regard to that. I think increasingly around the world, we're seeing where it's not just OPIC going into a major yep. project. Um, 
not Asia, but in UAE, when uh, the Koreans uh, put in new nuclear reactors, they got financing specifically because I think OPEC put in a small piece of it, yep. and that brought other yep. capital in. So that leveraging role that the mm -hmm. U.S. can play, even if you're not financing the entire thing, is very important. And Phyllis, to build on that, I mean, the other, and, and something Nigel said as well, our partners, Australia, yeah. uh, Japan, uh, members of the European Union have tremendous experience mm -hmm. in developing financial instruments mm -hmm. um, that fit specific risk criteria uh, for different types of infrastructure projects. And there's a lot right. we can learn from them, and we have now the ability to team right. with these right. institutions right. to mobilize mm -hmm. this capital so right. that we, we can learn a lot from our uh, partners in this process. Right. So bringing like-minded countries together is perhaps if we are competing with other big countries mm -hmm. out there is what we, we can do. And I, I, yeah. on the competition point, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. But on the competition point, I think that that there are there are plenty of ways in which the U.S. and China can cooperate yeah. as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and mm -hmm. Um, Western financial resources can be combined with Chinese financial resources mm -hmm. and well-structured projects um, to help uh, meet the infrastructure gap. So it's mm -hmm. not an either-or mm -hmm. situation. I think that there are mm -hmm. plenty of opportunities to partner, but we, we've got to get on the same page in terms of project selection and procurement right. and right. these sorts of right. things. I just came back from a week in China where we were specifically talking about that, and energy is actually one area in which that's very possible to do. Nigel, I just wanted to turn to you to um, ask you to expand a little bit on some of your remarks. You said uh, that Asia Edge is a very good start, certainly in terms of signaling, uh, to use Peter's word, and, and the prioritization of some key areas. But beyond being a good start, you know, we're almost a year out of the gate of this announcement. What is Chevron looking for as Asia Edge uh, fleshes out. I mean, what kinds of things would you like to hear more of that would be very helpful for for your goals? Um, so I, I think there was a lot of conversation around the financial backing between Asia Edge and how it competes with the Belt and Road Initiative. I, I think what people are looking for is turning uh, concepts into action. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the more wins you put on the board, some very tangible actions, whether that be a mm -hmm a floating regas mm -hmm. unit somewhere that is tied to a uh, utility provider in region that starts to electrify a country that doesn't have the infrastructure. They, they don't have to be big wins, I just think there have to be some wins. And I think we can talk a lot about the value proposition and how much money's behind, but that's yeah. great if it's just, if these trillions of dollars are sitting in a bank somewhere looking right. for a home, then what we have to do is provide a solution. And I, I actually think some of the countries you mentioned are looking for, you know, you talked about nationalization of resource. Uh, you know, we've been in Indonesia and Thailand for five decades in Thailand and nine decades in Indonesia. But we're seeing a nationalization of resource and I think that's part of this, this energy security. Yeah. I, I think it's about energy going from being an export to an import and I think the energy mix is changing. So I, I think it's about us partnering to put some wins on the board. Um, mm -hmm. I probably should use the rugby analogy, not a, uh -huh. not a cricket or, <laughs> or, or a baseball analogy, but I, I think it's the pace at which we do some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and, 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 and let's get something done. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get something actually over the finish line. I think some of the countries you mentioned will look to us and say, hey, I actually quite like the way the way that solution was created, it's more innovative, mm -hmm. it's more flexible, it's more transparent, and it comes with less um, ties. So I, I think that that's to me really the opportunity is uh, to let's, let's get something done. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. With that, if there are no more questions that the panel wants to pose to each other, I will turn to the audience uh, to see uh, if there are questions. Um, I see a gentleman here in the third row. If you could identify yourself first, sir, and ask a question. Ken Maricord again. Uh, currently, uh, as much uh, natural gas is flared in the Permian Basin as all of Central and South America can consume, uh, should we maybe apply to the Chinese for funds under the BRI to develop our infrastructure, namely pipelines, so that that gas can be made available to customers worldwide? I don't think you have to look at China to fund that. I, I, think, yeah. I, I think there are a lot of, of those countries would act like, actually like access to that resource. It's about the pace at which we build yeah. infrastructure out inside the domestic United States. That's not an, always an easy thing to do. 
Uh, we don't flare. Uh, we only we only take gas away if it goes in a pipeline. We'd like to see that pipeline access a different market, which would be through the LNG infrastructure that's emerging on the Gulf Coast. Um, I completely agree with you. I think that gas should be clearing the market and providing a low-cost energy solution somewhere. But I think you'll find there'll be infrastructure players. The United States has a, one of the most mature infrastructure capabilities to develop pipelines. Um, the Permian has grown so fast. Yeah. It's got out ahead of the infrastructure companies. Um, so you'll really see this takeaway capacity. There was a paper written, on, I think, two weeks ago that talked about the flaring oh. volume. So to me, that's, that's an opportunity for this industry. It will provide a very competitive, low-cost gas. Uh, land in Asia at a good cost. I think, I will tell you, I think the gas uh, resource and cost of development in the United States is going to reset energy costs around the globe. So it's a good thing around affordability but we need to get it into a pipeline, access to infrastructure and access to a different market, and that will happen. Terrific, okay, uh, a question here. And if you could identify yourself and direct your question to one of the panelists if you like. Sure, uh, Evan Carlick, probably a question best uh, for Brian or Peter. So we heard the Build Act mentioned a few times. It seems like the other landmark legislation that was passed last year and signed by the president was ARIA, the Asia Re uh, Reassurance Initiative Act. Um, and my understanding is it's mostly a messaging bill there was an authorization for some international development dollars, but I just want to see your assessment of that legislation, and do you also see that happening? My response is, uh, you know, we, we're waiting for concepts to move to action, uh, just as Nigel said, right? So I think there have been some, some great initiatives um, announced, uh, but I think the U.S. industry and the rest of the world is waiting to see how that actually converts to real transactions and real support on the ground. So uh, I think the jury's out. And for the Build Act, yeah, I, I've, I've talked about the action that we're undergoing right now, and that, that action goes live on the, on the 1st of October. And the, uh, I, I would say that obviously from the military, you, you probably have, have more of that national, national security focus. And, and we have had conversations with uh, with Indopaycom and, and the rest of the COCOMs. Uh, so, it's uh, you you will see that action. And we're out there working right now. We're out there working in those markets as as we speak. So, uh, action is happening. Do you think ARIA's legislation is significant, or is it really just a build act? So, what what I focus on is the build act. I I don't. Uh, I, I honestly don't know too much about that. So I, I it know. sends a signal, so. but it's an authorization, not an, an appropriation yet. Right. So when Congress appropriates to implement it, then we'll, we'll see more. And I'm sure there'll be events yeah. here at CSIS yeah. that will focus more on ARIA and its potential, but I think at this point it's still more potential than reality because of the lack of appropriations. Uh, yes, in the front row here, please identify yourself, ask a question. Uh, Chris McGrain, Woman Cray Foundation. So I, I'm wondering, uh, we keep on talking about great projects from all sorts of different funds, all sorts of different summit processes. Is there some way to put the great projects, even if they're only after they've turned out that they are definitely great, all in one collection so that you can learn from them? I mean, would the UN have a role to have a new college which is basically a data bank of great projects, but ones which then can also be searched by every dis discipline mm. from engineer to whether it's mm. energy or whether it's got AI in it or whatever? Mm. You, you know, how do we put all, all the best ones together? Is there a role for APEC to do something like that? Or perhaps um, they do in the, the energy there working There is group. already. Uh, we've and had, like I said, over the years, have had probably about 500 projects out of that, probably about 250 different publications. And uh, at the beginning, it was very hard to find them. You're right, you know, they were on a shelf in Singapore at the Secretariat. Uh, but the Secretariat in Singapore has put together a very good, very searchable database, and they've tried to go back as far as they can in terms of putting those volumes up. Uh, we also uh, would send people around talking to other groups like the G20 or 
the International Energy Agency, et cetera, to bring some of the results that we had done. But there's a database one can search and find them. There are, there are a couple of databases on, on China's Belt and Road projects. Uh, AEI has one. And of course, uh, CSIS hosts Reconnecting Asia, which is a website, reconnectingasia.org, um, that, uh, um, that tracks and analyzes infrastructure projects in the, in the region from all different you know, uh, funding sources and has a lot of good analysis on that. Um, but it does seem like um, this is an area that APEC or other uh, think tanks or private sector could play a role in. Um, other questions? Yes, here. Hi, I'm Jake Seelick from St. Lawrence University. Um, so this initiative has evident like crossover from previous development uh, goals and strategies from other energy initiatives. Um, my question is, how have the lessons learned from other uh, initiatives, whether they're challenges or successes, such as um, Power Africa, other whole of government approaches, be applied to ensure success in this initiative? And you're, you're talking mostly about Asia Edge, yeah, the energy yes, initiatives? Yeah, yeah. Um, Phyllis or Nigel, um, do you have any thoughts about that? One of the things, I, from having been involved in some of the other ones over the years, too, that I think Asia Edge, we heard a lot about it, has picked up is really to have that interagency coordination that wasn't always there in uh, earlier initiatives. Power Africa there was, and some of the ones that we've done in the last, uh, last administration definitely were. So picking up that whole of government interagency approach is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, we have one here from Brian. Thank you, Brian Harding from CSIS. Um, I thought I'd direct a question to Nigel, maybe Peter, or anyone else who wants to chime in. Um, we've talked a lot just generally about the opportunities in Southeast Asia, and we've also sort of talked generally about how wouldn't it be great if, we, if the US government could help mitigate risk in this place or the other. Are there particular countries that you see as big opportunities? Is, is it Myanmar or, or Vietnam? You know, if we could just get the financing right or the, the political risk right um, um, that, that could see Chevron or, or, or other US companies moving in in a serious way? Um, so I, firstly, the macroeconomics suggest Asia, the broader Asia, not just Southeast Asia, will consume 50% of the world's energy by 2040. That's really the major growth region. Um, I think when we've started to look country by country assessment, uh, both from an economics, a capability, a uh, geopolitical risk, uh, they're all a little bit custom by uh, tailored individually countries by countries, mm -hmm. which make them a little bit more complex to do. So this is why I think the partnership is going to be much more important to how you, how you create new and emerging markets. Uh, for, some, for some places, will be new country entries for some companies. That's not something that should be underestimated. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's helped with actually under, uh, underpinning that and framing out uh, we've had some conversations with Japanese utility providers who also see each country is going to be customized to its needs. I, I think eventually there'll be some commonality that will emerge. Um, but, but you see someone like Bangladesh today, it's got domestic gas needs that we're part of supplying. And right next door it's got LNG floating regas terminals. It's all part of this pace of development. And I think it will also be part of understanding um, some of the technology leaps are happening much faster in some of these countries, um, whether it's micro markets, micro LNG, micro grids for, for um, renewables. So it's just understanding, and I, I think the change for us as a company is understanding what solution are you looking for, rather than here's, you, you made a comment yeah. about government, but here's the answer. Yeah. Well, that answer may not meet all of those uh, risks, okay. economics, jobs, I mean, that, it's just really understanding what the solution each government's looking for, um, each country, each partner, and it's finding the sweet spot where we can partner with the U.S. government, um, partner with host government, partner with local utility providers, and be part of a, a much richer, much more beneficial, sustainable solution. 
Mm -hmm. I would just, just uh, sure. uh, build on that, just expand Nigel's comments uh, and apply them to the different sectors, right? whether it's a port facility or roads or airports, et cetera. It really depends on the, the dynamics of that particular country, the supply chains that are uh, involved or could be involved with that country. So I think you have to look at each country specifically and the, the particular conditions in that country and, the, um, and its relationship to your industry and uh, you know your value proposition so it's a uh, I think Nigel's comments could just you know apply a different lens move from the energy sector to the other other uh, infrastructure sectors and, and it's equally applicable. increasingly it's subnational groups that you have to deal with too be it you know yeah. a state in India or somewhere else not just the national that's right uh, question here in the in the row here Hi, Tricia Williams with the U.S. Energy Association. I'm going to follow up with his comment about Power Africa. One of the things they found in Power Africa was there was a great need for capacity building, mm -hmm. and they've been focusing on that more. So my question is twofold. One, have you looked at the capacity of the local entities and their ability to be able to maintain, operate, and deal with this large addition of infrastructure? And two, how does capacity building play into Asia Edge? What is that part of Asia Edge? Um, yeah, I'm not as sure, but certainly capacity building is something APEC has always prided itself on. Um, and certainly it's what we did in India through PACE, et cetera. That's for a lot of these countries. You can't sell your product until that capacity building, be it regulatory or elsewhere, or something else is finished. So I would assume that they're going to be focusing a lot on capacity building. You almost have to. I think that's another example of partnership because we've been doing that in some of these countries for multiple decades. Right. Um, it might not be in electrification, um, but we've been doing it in resource development. We've got nationalization of jobs, building job capability, uh, building skills, local content, uh, stimulating local economies. Those are all things we've been doing for multiple decades. Um, again, there's some lessons that we could bring to that conversation. Um, that I, I, none of those are insurmountable, they just need to have a commitment to do it. And I, I think once you start on that path, it's why we do STEM education locally, um, to actually fill the job pipeline, to provide our own capability. We'll do economic development to help companies stand up. Um, so those are all things we've done. I think there are many people in, across the United States have done that, and I think we can continue to do it. It's just a different opportunity. That's another area that I think we haven't done as much in is to really do public-private partnerships in terms of what that capacity building needs to be for certain markets. When we have done that, I think as we've done it with Chevron in the past, or mm -hmm. GE, et cetera, it's worked very well, but we should do more of that. Okay, um, uh, a question in the back here. Hi, my name is Chia Berkeley from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Uh, my question is, I think, for Brian Churchill. You mentioned that um, you'll be overseeing corruption uh, in developing countries when uh, you're working on the project and uh, rights of workers and you know environment, environmental issues. So could you please um, explain how the procedure goes in selecting local companies when, uh, you know, for example, in the island of the Philippines, they need electricity. So you need engineers, you need construction workers there. So there are a lot of companies locally. So how do you select uh, those companies or people who work uh, over there. Thank you. So that's a good question. Uh, we, are, we are basically like a bank. So uh, firms will come to us and in examining part of our due diligence is going to be looking at all of those categories to ensure that the firms that we're offering our financing to are compliant with each of those factors. And so those are determining factors of whether or not we approve that at a uh, credit committee or a board. And so we're not actually picking the firms ourselves. We rely on the, on the private sector to, to pick those firms, to pick their, you know, what, where and what they're, they're going to be operating in. And then we determine whether or not it fits within those categories. 
Well, we are uh, out of time. This has been a really interesting uh, conversation. I think it's really shown uh, what is going on in APIC, APEC and OPIC and uh, how these streams <laughs> come together in really fascinating and interesting ways. I think we're going to be looking forward to October 1st for the launch of the DFC and hopefully some announcements that will come uh, soon after of projects. And we look forward to APEC in Chile this fall and in Malaysia next year. Um, I think it'll be really important to see, um, not just from the DFC, um, but from other parts of the uh, open, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and these initiatives, Asia Edge and others, uh, some wins, some, some tangible projects that are announced and, and put on the board because I do, I, I very much agree with Peter that um, this, is, this is helpful signaling, but what the region is really looking for is commitment and seeing tangible projects that come out of these initiatives demonstrating that there is commitment in these particular countries, in these particular sectors, and demonstrate how countries like the United States and Japan and host countries can work together, how the private sector can worst work with governments, um, the United States and others, uh, will, be, will be really important to show that this is really meaningful going forward. So thank you so much for joining us today, and please join me in thanking our panelists, Phyllis, Nigel, Brian, and Peter.